Good morning, everyone. Let me draw your attention to some announcements that are very important. First one is Vacation Bible School. Uh, those working in it, there'll be a short meeting tonight at 7, so please remember that. And then also registration continues. VBS starts next Sunday evening, so registration continues, and it's very helpful. So if you want to register on one of the cards, uh, child's name and age, that would be helpful, um, are out at the table. And then, of course, there will be registration next week as it's beginning, so remember that. Uh, the M&M &M Mission fundraiser for our children and the mission trip they're going on, that continues if you've got containers and hadn't brought them back and plan to do that, that needs to um, happen as soon as possible as they're getting ready. Um, also, in the bulletin, um, you'll see the different things that are happening. I want to mention our Sunday night and Wednesday night program so everybody's on the same page. Starting tonight, we will not have a Sunday night program through the summer. Uh, we're going to have worship at Wing Deer Park and some different things happening. And we're doing it just opposite what we've done it the last many years. But we're going to have a Wednesday night Bible study. Just feel like that'll be a great time uh, to come back in midweek and worship, spend some time together and encouragement. So this Wednesday, that starts at 7 o'clock. Uh, and next week during Vacation Bible School, I don't believe, and I'm going to let you know next time for sure, there will not be uh, any program going on in this room. So if you're not participating in VBS as an adult, we'll have study in here during that time that uh, I'll be leading. So we'll do that on Wednesday nights through the summer. So please uh, remember that. That's very, very important. Um, other announcements, I'm just going to ask you if you would to take the time to read those. We're going to begin our worship this morning in a very important way. You're going to witness the baptism of two of our young people uh, into Christ. They'll be introduced to you at this time. And I don't think there's a better way in the world to start worship than witnessing this and then being able uh, to encourage them in uh, our response to that and encourage them uh, as we see them throughout the day today. Uh, we're also going to talk today and, and in our study around the table all of our music about the reverence of Christ, the reverence of God in worship. So let's please uh, remember that and make that very important. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. I'm going to ask you to stand, and after the prayer, you be seated and we'll witness the baptism. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come and worship this morning. And Father, we give you praise for this time of worship, this time of joy that we have. And Father, help us to be in reverence of God, in reverence of who you are, that we be in awe of you, Father, that we come to bow down before you at this time. Father, we give you praise for everything that is good and important in our lives. And Father, at this time, we come to you in confession, asking that you bless us as we repent and bring our sins before you. Father, prepare us for worship now the presence and the gift of your spirit at this time in our worship and in our hearts. And Father, we offer this prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus. And all of God's people say it. Amen. Please be seated. This is Mary Beth Sane. Mary Beth comes today after uh, praying and, and thinking for a long time. 
um, about if this was the decision that she was ready to make. Um, and Mary Beth and I talked this last week, um, and she has decided and she's ready to give her life to Christ. So Mary Beth, I'm going to ask now to repeat after me your profession of faith. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the, Christ the, Son the Son of the living God. All right. And upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. While our children are going out, uh, there's a lot going on this morning, but uh, that mic's working. <laughs> I'm having fun with them, John. David Folks has a three-week-old granddaughter here. I'm going to introduce her, and where is she? Is she in here? Anybody else's handler just throw it up here there. <laughs> she got past more than an offering plate back there. Yeah. So. This is Lena Reagan Fox, three weeks old tomorrow. Ten fingers, ten toes. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah and Sadie are here, I think. Scott in here? Okay, Scott. And Cheryl in here with you this morning? Okay, great. Left her at home. 
This is our second set of twins, one introduced last week and one this week. And I guess I shouldn't have said their name since you're coming to introduce them, Scott. But. And these roses are in their honor. Actually, I was going to introduce them as Jill and Davina, but... <laughs> This is, this is Sadie Ray. She was born March 25th, along with her sister. She was two pounds, 13 ounces. Uh, she's just a touch over five pounds now. They're, uh, I guess they're gonna be 10 weeks mm -hmm. on Thursday. You wanna introduce them? Yeah. This is Sarah Kate. She was actually born first of the two. She was born, uh, she was two pounds, 14 ounces, and she's now just a shade over six pounds. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. There's a lot to be thankful for these children. And Sarah and Sadie have uh, been in the hospital and are doing great. Sadie uh, had to have some uh, surgery with her heart, but it's doing, they're all doing very, very well. And we've had a lot to be thankful for with both sets of twins. So let's go to God in Thanksgiving right now. God, thank you for the children, grandchildren have been introduced this morning, Father. And we come to you with lots and lots of thanksgiving for their health, and for their parents. Father, we especially ask that you be with Scott and Cheryl now and this big change in their life and the love that they have to offer, the Christian love they have to offer these girls. Father, bless them in every walk of their life and everything they do. And Father, we give this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ready to worship? Let's stand together as we begin our worship this morning.
Leviticus 26, 2. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Worship is a covenant and call from our Lord to come before him and meet him with reverence, gladness, and joy. Pray with me, please. God, we come before you now to give you the glory and honor and praise that you deserve. We cast all of our cares at your feet and focus all of our thoughts on you. We pray that our worship is beautiful and pleasing to you. We know that there is no higher calling to de- than to be right here at this moment, seeking your face and loving you. your feet, oh Lord, is the most high place in your presence.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Many of you will know the, those words of the Apostle Paul in his le first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. We use them often when we gather to break the bread and to drink of the cup. This is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Because we think some have taken the words far beyond their original meaning, we sometimes fail to come close to that original meaning. Because some have supposed that the bread and the cup, or its contents, are literally transformed into his physical body and his physical blood, we have sometimes missed the reality, the spiritual reality communicated in our Lord's words. This is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is because of this reality that Paul goes on to say in the next few verses that because some fail to discern the body and the blood when partaking, when participating in the Lord's Supper, they become weak and sick and a number sleep, a metaphor for death. Sound a bit harsh? Not at all. Paul just wants us to know that as the physical body will die without nourishment, so too will the spirit. Paul wants us to know that without specific times and specific acts to call us back to the source of life, we will likely be diverted to the source of death. Without times of worship, without times in the Word of God, without times at the table, the distractions of the world will likely result in our spiritual starvation. So, when we break the bread and drink the cup, we do so with great reverence and awe. We refocus our attention on things eternal. When we hold in our hands the bread, we think of the body of Christ broken for us. We think of the body of Christ broken for us. We think of the body of Christ broken for us. When we eat the bread, we in a very real, if spiritual, way ingest the person of Christ so that he becomes the stuff of which we are made. His mind becomes our mind. His thoughts become our thoughts. His eyes become our eyes so that we see others and the world as he sees them. He becomes 
the stuff of which we are made. So, when we drink of the cup, we do so with reverence and awe. We renew our commitment to the new covenant established in the blood of Christ. We renew our commitment to becoming a Christ kind of person. We declare our intention to listen before we speak, to seek direction before we travel, to seek instruction before we act, to listen to God, to find direction from God, to find discernment in God's will. So, with great reverence, come to the table. With great reverence, come to the mercy seat of His grace. Come as you are, unworthy as you are. But come with reverence. Come because He invites you to meet Him here. Do not miss this great encounter whether by refusing to come or by not recognizing that, that of the bread, Jesus said, this is my body. Of the cup, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Come with reverence to the table of God. Come eat and live. Come, drink and live. Come with reverence. Come with purpose. Come. He waits for you here. He waits for you here. Let us pray. Our Father, as we come to this table in time of reverence and also to this worship service in time of reverence, help us to discard the distractions of the world that take our focus and attention away from you. Help us to bring those items to you. We know who is in control. Also help us nurture our spirit and inspire us. Teach us and guide us. In these things we pray in your name. Amen.
It was Jesus who said, this is my body. Take and eat, all of you. Likewise, it was he who said of the cup, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come now at this time of service, Lord God, to just give back a portion of that which you've given us. Everything belongs to you, Father. And we thank you so much for the many blessings you've given to us. We ask now that you take this offering, Lord God, and, and use it to spread the kingdom, the word throughout all the world, this community. And Father God, just help us to be good stewards of everything you give us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Several weeks ago, the elders and I were together on a Wednesday night, and we filled out what we titled a personal worship evaluation form, that we read a group of questions as if we were being asked by God to, to answer them, and we ranked ourselves and then talked about where we found ourselves and 
then took that to God in prayer. We could rank as low as one and as high as five. And the first two questions were, you prepared yourself for worship long before you arrived at church. Or you arrived on time for your appointment to worship me. And we thought about, were we prepared? Had we been working at preparation in the hours and maybe the days before? And we ranked ourselves. We talked a few weeks ago about the importance of preparation in worship. We talked about the importance of adoration. You expressed your adoration of me with enthusiastic singing. And you confessed your sin to me with complete honesty. We talked about confession one Sunday from the pulpit. The ones that today's sermon were birthed in were these two statements or questions as if they were from of God. You humbled yourself in reverence at the reading of my word. And you recognized the unique word that I prepared for you in today's scripture and today's sermon. And we talked about the importance of the word and the importance of preaching in a worship service. And today we'll talk about reverence. I want to read from the prophet Habakkuk. And he had gone to God in complaint about all that was happening. He begins early in his letter by saying, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or I cry out to you violence, but you do not save? And why do you make me look at injustice? Sounds like today, doesn't it? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. And then he says, therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails and the wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. He has several complaints about what he's seeing, much like the world today, nothing's new. And the Lord in his answer says to him, of what value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies? Or he who makes it trust in his own creation, he makes idols that cannot speak. And woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, but there is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, and let all the earth be silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all of the earth be silent before him. We are told in the New Testament that we are the temples of God. Be silent before him in reverence. I want us to do something just a bit different this morning. We'll take a few moments to greet each other. But in doing that, I'm going to ask you, let's offer the handshakes and the smiles of welcome in total silence of worship, realizing that we're in the presence of the Lord. Let's stand together and let's take a few moments to, in silence, greet all of those who are around us. You may be seated. Something big was getting ready to happen to the Jewish people. They were the chosen people of God and they were to soon receive the word of the Lord, the commandments of God that we know as the Ten Commandments. The first one being to have no other gods before them. We're going to read scripture from Exodus 19 in just a few moments. But as we prepare to do that and see how they approach this great time, I want us to see that when we approach God in reverence and in faith and trust, that great things can happen in lives. We can look at worship as a continuum, an extreme, two extremes. One is the view that a skeptic has, that it is a total waste of time for a group of people 
to come together on a Sunday morning and spend any time at all singing, any time at all around a table called the Lord's Table, remembering Christ, any time at all in His Word. Why would anyone waste such precious time doing something so foolish? The other end of the, the spectrum is the 100% pure believer. Not an ounce of skepticism in them, no questions. And they understand that coming together to worship is the most important use of time that anyone has ever been given. They literally would crawl across glass to be able to come and be a part of worship. There would be no excuse, nothing whatsoever that would stand between them and worship. And I suspect that most of us fall somewhere in between on those two extremes of the spectrum. I hope that as we talk of reverence today, and the very fact that we're here, that we're not skeptics, and that we're moving toward that pure belief that says, no matter what, no matter where, no matter when, I'm going to worship. And I think it's important to say, I understand there's people here who probably are skeptics. It was easier to be here than to create the problem it might create to not be here. Remember, Jill and I went to see Kenny Rogers on our first ever date. It was interesting how we worked it out that we'd be able to go and that I'd be able to drive at the ripe age of 16 in one month. Her mother wasn't real appreciative of it, but we went and we got home safe and several years later married. So we owe our happy marriage to Kenny Rogers. <laughs> and I might add to age myself and the first edition. We went on an anniversary several years later to the King Center of Performing Arts to see Kenny Rogers. You know you've lost your rock appeal when you're performing at a place called Center for the Performing Arts. He asked a question of those who were near the front. How many of you are here because your spouse made you come and you really don't like Kenny Rogers? One man named Earl had the nerve to raise his hand. Kenny Rogers spoke to him for a minute and said, It's my job to make you appreciate my talent. And I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. And he reached in and pulled out a wad of money, huge wad of money. And he said, Every time I start a song and you can call out the title, I'll give you $20. I wish I would have raised my hand. <laughs> he sang, and I began to count the $20 instead of listening to the music and he paid the gentleman nearly $300 that night. I guess Kenny Rogers can afford it. But I realize some of us here may be skeptics. And some of us here are very reverent of who Christ is. And some of us need to maybe understand in reverence what the word even means. I want you to listen, not to a dictionary definition, but how it is witnessed. In worship where there is reverence, we individually carry a deep respect of God to this gathering. A deep respect, number one. We carry a love for God that's deeper than love we can have for anything or anyone else to this gathering. A very deep and intense love. And we come in awe of who God is. And that may be the hardest for us today but we come in awe of who God is. An understanding that there is no other worship. There is but one Spirit and one Lord and one baptism, as the Scripture says, and one God of creation who loves us deeply. Now I want you to listen to those again. There will be deep respect, there will be deep love, and there is an awe of who God is when we come to worship in reverence. Now what's the opposite of reverence? Not irreverence. What is the opposite? And I would say that opposite of reverence is familiarity. We, we have decided that we know God so well that we have lost any awe of Him. I remember when people would get a job at the Cape working around the space shuttle and they had a license plate or a bumper sticker a lot of them would get right after they started working that would say, doing that which others only dream of doing. 
And I remember watching the first launch of a shuttle and being in absolute awe of what I was seeing. But after a while, it became the familiar. After the while, it became something that Jill and I and our family began to take for granted. And I remember hearing those that were in awe of the work they were doing before long beginning to complain about the work they were doing as if it were just another job. And they began to dream of things other than that job. They were familiar. How many of us have become familiar with God or suppose ourselves to know Him so well that we never walk into a church service in reverence, in awe, in love, and with overwhelming respect of who He is? I want us to listen to this scripture again in Exodus 19, and I want us to, to ask ourselves a question. So if you're the only person hearing the scripture, in my worship, for you, for me, in my worship, do I lean more toward reverence or more toward the familiar when it comes to God? Now we're going to compare ourselves to a group of people getting ready to worship, and I want you to listen, 10 through 19. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothes. And be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. What if we set up a, an internet or an email chain in the church, most people have it, or a phone chain, where you were reminded by the elder that you're shepherd or by the, the ministers or the staff that's here at the church, on Thursday to begin to prepare for Sunday. Every week, it's Thursday. Start preparing for Sunday. Get your best ready. Make your plans. Make sure the time is being protected. Don't allow anything to become between you and your worship of God that's coming. And then on Friday, you begin to hear it again. Let's be in prayer. It's very important what we're beginning to do. That's what they were doing. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them in verse 12, Be careful that you do not go up the mountain or touch the foot of it, and whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows, and not a hand is to be laid on him of protection. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up on the mountain. What if that email and those phone calls begin to say, don't show up Sunday morning without deep respect, deep love, bowing before God. And if you do, you will die. You won't be tolerated. Was worship important? Was coming in the presence of God important? Was reverence important? After Moses had gone down the mountain in verse 14, to the people he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. And then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. That's a verse for another time. But it had to do with cleansing and purity as they came before God. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. It thundered this morning when we were reading that during first service. Everyone came forward at the invitation. <laughs> Everyone in the camp trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. And the smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently a lot of manuscripts say all the people trembled violently and thus gave the sound to the mountain and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder and then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him with thunder prepared man meeting an all powerful God and great things happen so that just a few verses later we read of one of the most powerful things that's happened in all the history of mankind and that's the receiving of what we know as the Ten Commandments. 
our whole system of justice based on it. Everything we know that's good in life based on it. It becomes the guiding point for living a Christian life, but at the same time for pointing out our sin and the need for Christ as a Savior. Very important. But preceding that was reverence and awe of God so that he was able to work among people. And so often we wonder, why does God not work like he used to? I don't know, but I would ask the question too, do we approach him in the reverence and with the reverence than we should? I want to ask everybody to do something. Please do this. Take your bulletins and there's a place there that you can write some notes down. And even if you never write notes or in your Bible even, I want to ask you to write these three or four questions down. And I feel like a good way for us to deal with reverence is to just answer these questions. Just think about them and answer them. And I hope you'll take them away from here today and be thinking about them uh, as you go into your week and through your week. First question, they'll be on the screen, but you can make sure and we'll leave them up. Can a man or a woman of multiple gods really walk in reverence of just one God? Can a man or woman of multiple gods really walk in reverence of just one God? We're going to hear over the next few weeks and next few months everything that is wrong in this world. We're already hearing it. Just gloom and doom everywhere. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But with the onset of the internet, a great tool when used as Christians and a horrible tool when used by the world, we have lies that go out every day, even lies couched in the name of Christ. And we create a lot of little gods. A lot of people that are important and what they say. And we, we go searching for what someone else says. Our local church isn't enough. Reverence for God and corporate worship isn't enough. We have a political situation in the world that's volatile to say the least. And we are constantly being pushed toward diversity. And I want to tell you something. If you're in reverence of God, in reverence of God, Yahweh, In reverence of God, there can be no other gods, and you cannot change the God of history that we've been given. He loves us, He died for us, and He is the only God. But we're pushed toward everything else. Now, when Jesus said, there's no way to the Father but by me, listen closely. He was not condemning any group of people. He was crying out to everyone because all have sinned. Now, don't say reverence to God means I can hate people who don't worship the God I know. Reverence to God means we'll love people no matter how much they hate us in return. Don't have those small gods. We're bombarded by them. Small gods. I saw on a sign this morning, I thought, how great an illustration for how ridiculous it can get. But the sign said that June is National Corn Dog Month. What are we supposed to do? I guess, eat a corn dog. But who decided that? I don't remember that. Little gods are given to us with the reality of the busyness of our lives. God's pushed aside so that something else becomes an object of worship, if even just for a few minutes or a day. I mentioned last week some of the high school seniors that had just graduated and were here to worship the next day and did not use the day before and the festivities of the day and one of the biggest milestones in their life, if not the biggest at this point in their life, as an excuse to not worship. We had a family come at 8.30 today that's always here at 10.30. Their son's a very good baseball player. and He played out of town yesterday in the tournament, and the tournament continues today out of town. They came home to worship and make the trip again today so that nothing got between them and their worship of God. Busyness of life can get in the way. And that's when we make decisions. 
That's when we make decisions. It can be the yard work. It can be the day on the lake. It can be someone's visiting. That's when we make decisions. Another family told me yesterday of someone that's moving into the area, a friend, family. They're looking forward to it and said, we already told them when they asked us about moving and how we felt about it that we looked forward to them being here and that we'd be in worship every Sunday morning and hope they would join us. Are there any little gods that get in the way? The God of my aching back? The God of I didn't get enough sleep? The God of it's raining and the umbrella left at work? Can we really say that's reverence and awe of God? Wrestle with the question. Next question can a person walk in reverence of a God that seems so far away? You know, one of the things that early man, and you define them the way you want, but early man knew was boundaries of time and space. It must have been comfortable thinking the moon and the stars and the sun and everything revolved around you. It must have been very comfortable to know if you got too far out of town, you fell off the earth. Probably kept travel to a minimum. But we don't know those boundaries, do we? We know a lot more about size and time. The Hubble Telescope's latest discovery is said to be 500 million light years away. And to argue that's what they see seems to me like we're going to stand on the pedestal stupid and claim it. We know a lot about size. And God can seem so far away. Evil can make God seem so far away. That's what Habakkuk was talking about and David talked about so much. How much more do I have to look at injustice, God? Where are you? I've seen tears cried this morning because of that injustice. I'm talking to someone after first service. We pick up the papers. We read news 24 hours, 7 days a week to tell us how evil the world is. And you just think of the news we see here recently this week. A man in our own community being tried for a brutal murder that happened four or five years ago. And replayed for us in the papers almost daily. We hear about foreclosure on homes. And that reminds us of evil and pain. We hear so much, and you can agree if it's there or not, but we hear so much about the worldwide consumption problem. We're using too many of our resources. We hear daily about dog-eat-dog -dog dictators that want nothing more in the world than people to hate and people to destroy. And they use that as constant propaganda. It seems we face quite often with candidates that are caught in lies after lie and nobody seems to worry about it. Doom and gloom. But I would tell you that when you think of the size, God gets bigger. And the more you look at evil, the more you see the love of God and the light burns brighter. There is no answer for size and there is no answer for evil outside of a reverence for God. And in Christ, he closed the distance. In Christ, he screamed out over those light years or over those three miles how much he loves us. In Christ, he showered the whole world with hope. And in reverence of God, there is hope. If only a spark in the vast wasteland of history, it's still a spark of hope. In the vast wasteland of disobedience, it's a spark of hope. And what can happen to every spark can be fanned into a flame of salvation and love and restoration. So the scripture says, Jesus came. To reconcile us to this huge God. Reverence. I'm glad he's big. That makes his love bigger. And in darkness we can find the joy of his light. What truly is to be revered? Please write that question down too. What truly is to be revered? God and God only. Outside of God, all else becomes false worship, whether we call it that or not. 
listen please. And I want to read just some thoughts that as I wrestled with this I wrote. Things fall apart and anarchy is loosed where there is no center. There is no hope if first and foremost there is not a time where we must look up and bow to one who has no rival. We bow to one whose size and whose justice and whose presence and whose goodness is overwhelming. What truly is to be revered is answered in one word, God, who is the one and the only living God. We can debate a lot of things in church. We can waste a lot of time on opinions and dates and all the things that some of the Scripture New Testament warns us about. We can sit in judgment of a worship service as if we are to be the judges of worship. We can question relationships that we know absolutely nothing about. But when it comes time for reverence, the I am cannot be debated. Who shall I say sent me? And God answered, I am. Last question. What does reverence do in a practical day-by-day -day living? A lot of people here know Bible stories, and I would say a Bible story is nothing more than a Bible story. It can be told by anybody alive. But with reverence, it comes alive. With reverence in any story from the Scripture, we see God and we see ourselves and God is never forgotten. In reverence, we become one with eternity. In reverence, we become like creation. Hebrews tells us longs for His return. In reverence, lives are made rich and hope is ignited. In reverence, you are given purpose. In reverence, we learn the comfort of bowing down and knowing we aren't in charge, and we have no anxiety. So let me close with what I think is some very serious time together to think about it, and I hope you'll take these questions and just ponder them this week. Add your own thoughts. Let's revere. Let's worship with deep respect, with huge love, and bowing down in awe of who God is. There is no other hope. There is no other way. We bow down before Him. Let's stand together for a word of prayer. And then we'll sing an invitation time and any decision that anyone wants to make. I'll ask you to come at that time. Father, thank you that you are God and that we can worship. And Father, we just have the seeds of thought and scripture and thinking planted in our minds today, Father. And we ask that you'll walk with us, that we'll take these questions in this scripture and really ask ourselves, Father, where are we on a continuum from skeptic to just a sold-out pure believer? Father, work with us and grant us your spirit to help us in this journey and in this walk. Forgive us when we have judged. Forgive us when we've looked to places other than the church for guidance. Places other than you, Father, in your scripture for what your will is to be. Father, we thank you that we have a time of worship, that we have worship today. And we pray that this prepares us for the day and the week ahead until we're able to meet again. Father, so often we pray to begin a service and now I ask that we pray this to close. From this moment on, it's not about me, but it's all about Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.
Father in heaven at Boone's Creek Christian Church, our leaders plan very hard every week not to come to you in a ritualistic way. We change things in our worship and have variety so that it is fresh as we think about you in an attitude of our reverence for you. And we ask you today that your Holy Spirit that you placed within us will help teach us how to approach you in holiness, in humility, and in perfect reverence. Reverence because we respect you. We repent of the awe we used to have in ourselves and appreciate the awe we have for you. With reverence toward you and your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul. dismissed.